Ladies and gentlemen, I believe today I'm bringing you something very special. Early this year, the popular YouTube channel, What I've Learned, released a video titled Vegan Diets Don't Work, Here's Why. And boy were the vegans not happy. Most of the debunked videos said something on the line of he didn't even prove that vegan diets don't work, which is true. I believe that if he could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that vegan diets are impossible, there would still be vegans of course, but way less. What I've Learned video has many flaws. His video would be more accurately named, vegan diets are hard, have many flaws, and fixing those flaws can be possible but perhaps are not easy due to the fact that we don't have long-term studies on vegans. That is a good way to not get a lot of views. However, vegans did not realize that the title was just clickbait, that the video itself is on a different topic. It's one of the downsides of YouTube and we all do it. And before vegans start to cry, look at the clickbait thumbnails that some of them do. Unfortunately, vegan influencers focused on this title way too much, a little bit like a bull going for the red dots, not realizing they were doing exactly what was expected of them. Instead of you having to lose a few hours watching all these videos, let me save you some time and tell you exactly what's gonna happen. What I've learned mentioned that veganism is perhaps possible but should not be recommended due to the lack of knowledge that nutrition as a whole has. The vegan response is, you need not prove that veganism is impossible, Therefore, all your arguments are null and void. My response to vegans will be, while it's true that veganism cannot be unproven, at least not yet, since it might work for some people, it is far from being proven safe. Nor does it show that it's an ideal diet. My video will also mention that veganism can actually be quite detrimental. If you want to go in depth regarding the topic of today, here's a list of videos that I would recommend for you to view in order. Most of it can just be listened to. With the intro out of the way, we can finally get into the meat and potatoes of the video. Are you ready folks? Let's begin. What I've learned channel and this creator Joseph have quite the grasp on their corner of YouTube. I find it fascinating his videos regarding fasting and I've been a subscriber to the channel for a while now. His edits are great and his videos are very well produced. I think his biggest mistake regarding this video is that he aimed it at vegans directly. While his videos before that only danced around the subject, this one really threw a wrecking ball at it, which got the vegan side in very defensive mode and much less open to argumentation. Perhaps his intention was to provoke them and it definitely got that reaction. One major flaw of this video is that Joseph assumed that people watching it have already watched his other videos or at least would watch them after this one. Most important of all probably would be the one named Supplements. Most of the problems regarding supplements he mentioned on his previous video, not on this one. Things like supplements not being regulated, supplements having weird interaction with other nutrients and unforeseen side effects of supplements are huge gaping holes in the vegan ideology that Joseph left out of this video. Understandable since I'm sure he did not want his video to be too bloated, but because this video was his first direct against veganism, no corner should have been cut. I think that one of his best arguments was when he presented the generation problem. Things that we assume are healthy for us today might be causing damage for the next generation and make it even worse for the ones after that. This is why nutritional science has to evolve so slowly. Unfortunately, vegans got distracted with the cats to understand the point of the argument. The point was not the cats. The point was really to notice that some behaviors that seem fine today may reveal problematic for our descendants. That is why veganism, a diet that only has been around for 60 odd years, is very dangerous. Vegan kids might only have slightly lower values than omnivores today, but what about their kids and the ones after that? Are the benefits of veganism so great that we are willing to risk the chance of crippling a generation? Chris, so, I couldn't agree more. I've written many articles, don't be a yeah. dumb vegan, and I don't mean to offend, <laughs> but, you know, uh, we are prone to have a few holes in the wall that an intelligent person knows how to plug. So Medicinal I science has to tackle this problem every day, and that's why so many medicines are unfit for pregnant women, mostly because we don't want to risk fetal development that is so susceptible to influences. Caffeine, raw fish, unpasteurized cheese, undercooked meat and eggs, pre-prepared fruit and vegetables and alcohol are all examples of things that are fine for us but is very unwise for pregnant women or developing children. The difference between these and veganism is that veganism has been around way less than all the others. This is the debate that needs to happen and no one is talking about it. On to the vegan response. And we start with a classic. Why would a 2016 study find that 84% of vegans eventually quit their diet? And to that I say, if exercise improves health so much, why would a study find that most people who exercise eventually quit exercising? I have always found it funny when vegans compare quitting veganism to exercise. It is such a dumb comparison. Their argument is, 
just because people give it up does not mean it's a bad thing. The amount of people giving it up is the smoke of the fire that is veganism. But veganism and exercise are not even close of being the same choice. Exercise requires you to go out of your way to do it, to find time, perhaps buy extra materials, and you need that motivation and persistency to have results. Veganism, nowadays, it's not a hard choice. You must eat anyway, so why not choose vegan? Whether you are cooking or ordering, the choice is always there side by side. No extra effort is required and yet people still avoid it. According to vegans, it's even cheaper than omnivore diets. You don't even need to be vegan 100% of the time, so why not just the majority of the time? Comparing veganism to exercise is such an odd choice. If you are going to compare it to exercise, you should say that veganism is like CrossFit. A fat diet fueled by drugs with some weird founders with some fanatic followers that tend to get injured even while using lighter weights. It's often the fact CrossFitters don't seem to shut up about CrossFit. A common stereotype is that once you start CrossFit, it becomes your personality and pretty much all you care about. CrossFit is a lifestyle. It's not uncommon for the media to refer to it as a cult. All hail the cult -ter of CrossFit. The stereotype of CrossFitters almost worshipping CrossFit. But did you know that CrossFit is the only way to work out? How they try and recruit new members. CrossFit's not just an exercise, it's a cult, I mean way of life. The arguments against this part of the video were they were not really vegan, they mixed up vegans and vegetarians, ethical vegans adhere more than health vegans. Regarding the argument they were not really vegans, I think vegans should really stop using this argument until you decide what the ideal vegan diet is. Get your counsel together and decide what the vegan diet is at least for one week. An argument with no substance because none of the vegans can agree what a vegan diet is. And one last time, let's look a little bit more into that 84% study. What's interesting is that if you actually read into the study, you'll find that the vast majority of people who quit weren't even experiencing ill health. The paper mentions a small proportion of individuals experiencing ill health and Daniel says the vast majority of people who quit were not experiencing ill health. Imagine you having a treatment that fails 30% of the time and you say that it's mostly successful. If you would enforce everyone to be vegan in this world and these numbers are correct, then 5.6 billion people will would want to quit vegan for any reason. Out of those, 1.6 billion would report adverse health effects. And remember, this is the number for the people that quitted you still have to add those that suffered on a vegan diet, but stayed vegan for ideology. Perhaps less people would have experienced ill health if they supplemented what they needed to. But something that vegans don't understand is that even if supplements worked 100% of the time with 100% effectiveness, in medicine, a big problem is that people forget to take their medicine. So why risk such a diet? Also, he says that the vast majority of people who quit were not experiencing ill health. This ignores the point that a lot of vegans say, which is, they didn't do it for long enough. Well, maybe if they did it for long enough, even more problems would arise. Also, also, the definition of 30% ill health included the quote, experiencing any of the following, protein, vitamin or mineral deficiency. If this is true, according to this paper, 42% of the people say they never even checked their B12 deficiency. Then, how would they know if they were experiencing deficiencies. Did you just assume that everyone not reporting deficiency were in perfect health? So to claim that 84% of vegans abandoned a vegan diet by using a figure which included vegetarians is beyond idiotic. Like oh, okay vegans. And your Bible does not? The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics made broad statements regarding vegan children and vegan mothers without even including vegan studies. Don't get me wrong, neither side is correct, but veganism is seen as an advanced form of vegetarianism. All the benefits that vegetarians indulge in are extrapolated further into vegans, and so are the detriments. It's not ideal, but since vegans are in such fewer numbers, and a lot of the vegans even cheat, it's really as close as we can get. Those who were consuming their diet for ethical reasons were far more likely to adhere to their diet than those who decided to consume one for reasons like health or taste preference. This is really a non-factor for the discussion since we are talking about health. What you fail to mention is that a large quantity of people that mention health reasons to quit. If such a percentage was extrapolated to the whole population, you would have millions of people suffering from such a diet. Maybe because they did it wrong? The discussion goes into mouth development. 
and how the skull structure should be the result of our poor nutrition diets. The vegan response is, vegans are not a large portion of the population, so mouth development is not an exclusive vegan issue. The second one is that mastication is the problem, and that and it's not the nutrients in the food. Regarding the first point, vegans tend to use this argument a lot. This argument will come up later, a few more times, but for now, I just want to mention the lack of awareness from the vegan side. Our current diet is deficient in nutrients and high in calories. Are vegan diets more deficient in certain nutrients than omnivores? Undoubtedly, yes. Can you compensate it with supplements? Perhaps. But the argument, the population is already in a shitty situation, so further restrictions will not cause problems, is an irrational argument, and vegans should really drop it. Currently, you are comparing it to the standard American diet. That is a very low bar. For the sake of science, please drop this argument. So in this case, it's the cause of something that has nothing to do with vegan diets. Here, he is attributing the issue to the consumption of less nutrient-dense foods. So it's unclear what he thinks at this point is causing the problem. It's Daniel argues that Joseph is being misleading because in one video, he points out that mastication is the problem, while on the other video, the absence of nutrient-rich foods like meat is the problem. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. The two arguments can overlap. They are not mutually exclusive. The problems to our development can come from both the lack of muscle exercise through mastication and lack of nutrients needed for good development. <laughs> I know, mind blown. I would say that vegans are in a catch-22 in regards to this. Ideally, for good jaw development, you would want nutrient-rich foods and hard-biting stuff. Because vegans admit that raw vegans cannot get enough nutrients and cook vegans cannot get enough mastication since their foods turn into mush, then what is the correct ratio? Half and half? Meat eaters would go for stuff like wings, bones, sinew, and even tougher meats that require some level of jaw strength. Vegans have fruits that are crunchy, but don't require a lot of strength of mastication. So, if you add raw foods to your vegan diet, such as broccoli, you would not be able to get as many nutrients, according to vegans, not me. Which means you would have to eat more. Would that be a good solution? A study of 105 countries in the Journal of Economics and Human Biology noted that animal food, particularly dairy, most correlated with increases in height. Such studies are susceptible to something called the ecological fallacy, meaning what applies on a country average level may not apply on an individual level. LVL makes an interesting point in mentioning the ecological bias in these kinds of studies. However, he does not mention if this study in specific actually suffers from such a bias. With this kind of logic, I can dismiss the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics paper on veganism just by pointing out the author's biases. What I did instead was noticing every single point that they got wrong, or better yet, did not even study. Feel free to watch that video. I'm quite proud of it. Potatoes were more associated with height than total meat, milk, beets, eggs, and pork. A study that mentions in the title correlation should be used very carefully. Like LVL says, other factors may be at stake here, such as healthcare and living conditions. But the correlations between the two areas he mentions are different correlations. If we look at this map, we will see that the plant protein countries are, on average, shorter than the meat protein countries. So why would we follow the plant protein correlations? What does this prove? Absolutely nothing. It is a correlation. Is milk good for you if you want to grow? Is it ideal? We might never know. What it is, is a great source of calories and vitamins that quite a lot of people around the world depend on. Not to mention a great source of fermented products such as kefir, yogurts, as well as delicious cheese that is fundamental in so many cultures and diets. These fermented foods have been proven without a shadow of a doubt to help the microbiome in your gut. India, a country that is often given by vegans as an example on how veganism can work, ghee, curd and yogurt are a staple in most famous dishes. Absence from milk and dairy in general would be a great loss for humanity, and any diet that cuts it out hopefully has a good reason to do so, and even a better substitute for it. LVL at some point mentions... It's not like vegans think it's a good idea to replace a food like cow's milk with soda, Instead, we would suggest something like a vitamin-fortified soy milk. It is interesting that just not long ago, Oatly got into trouble for hiding the amount of sugar in their oat drinks. Because their sugar molecules are broken down by enzymes in factories, the glycemic index of oat milk is actually very high. Daniel carefully mentions soy milk specifically, since soy milk and whole milk have about the same GI of 30. 
I did find a study commenting on how in vitro soy milk can have up to 58 in the GI score, but I had to dismiss it since it was funded by the Dutch Dairy Association. You can't really get more biased than that. I do have a question for the vegans. If soda like Coke Zero would be fortified just like soy milk, would you recommend it? For some reason, it does not feel right, but scientifically speaking, it would bring about the same benefits. What if I drink Coke Zero at the same time as I take a multivitamin? Would that be the same? It's not an attack, it's a genuine question for any vegans that would like to answer. Between the 18 minute mark and the 21 minute mark, the discussion revolves around anecdotes and certain vegans that did it wrong. I don't know if any of you listening has ever worked in a hospital, but anecdotes can be a huge driving force for research and funding. I think vegans dismiss too quickly the personal experiences. Well, that's just an I anecdote. I had a really low immune system. That's an anecdote. We for example, when vegans give examples of athletes that have been successful vegans, I don't just say personal anecdotes and move on. I search and research and see what they are doing to make the diet work. Usually it's lying, but I still give them the benefit of the doubt. The problem comes when thousands of anecdotes are dismissed without second thought. Unfortunately, nutritional science might never be unraveled due to the ethical constraints of doing experiments in humans. Most nutritional science, even large-scale ones, account in large part with the personal testimonies. Simply because it would be silly to say that, oh, the person died, but at least their markers were great. A good example of this are the studies that show people with lower cholesterol dying sooner. Great. We lower their cholesterol if only they didn't die sooner. So, when conducting experiments on humans, the value of the personal experience is always taken into account. The testimonies from ex-vegan influencers are very interesting to consider because they had so much to lose. It was not just health reasons, it was not just ethical reasons, there was also a financial and social reason as well. Does their failure prove that vegan diets are impossible? No. Do they show that perhaps vegan diets are not as easy, simple and healthy as people claim to be? Certainly. A lot of vegan influencers dunking on these ex-vegans also mentioned that the people that failed the vegan diet were doing crazy things like fasting for long periods of time or drinking weird stuff. But they never question how does these things come about? No one is born with these kind of ideas. If you look at the beginning of their vegan journey, just like all vegans, at first they felt better by cutting out processed food and adopting a whole food vegan diet. But as their deficiencies start to show up, the people start to make small changes. As things get worse, they also get more desperate and try to more radical solutions. At some point, if you are desperate enough, you will try anything that has the smallest chance of working. It is such a strange notion to ignore hundreds of testimonies in regards to health and not learn anything from it. The discussion then develops into vitamin A. Daniel completely forgets to talk about the important point that Willa brought up. Further, depending on your genes, your conversion rate could be even lower. This is the case for me and for potentially as many as 37% of people of European descent. If this is taken as true, then some vegans would need to add another supplement like retinol to their growing list of necessary supplements. This has over 10,000 micrograms of retinol, and the upper limit of retinol is 3,000 micrograms, and hypervitaminosis A is no joke. Vegans will say, what about the carnivores? If they eat too much liver, they will get too much vitamin A. This is a weak argument in all fronts. From the same line of thought, we can say that overconsuming beta-carotene is linked to cancer, when it's only been shown as such in excess consumption through supplementation. Both situations are only really observed when supplements are taken in excess. Daniel makes an interesting point regarding conversion of beta-carotene into vitamin A, being regulated by the body, which is great but forgets to mention what is needed for such a process to happen. Dietary fat is needed to help absorption. Zinc plays an essential role in this conversion. Vitamin E is thought to protect the carotenoids from oxidation. You need proper thyroid function and intestinal function. If any of these elements are missing, your conversion will suffer. So the RDA for zinc and vitamin E for vegans might be higher than the omnivores in order to help with this conversion. It is typical vegan discussion. In theory, there might be no issue, but in practicality, the risk of issues might not be worth the benefits. I think it's very funny that 1805 Daniel kind of makes a jab against Freely. Some even believe that once you are purified, you will lose your period and are then clean. And I still believe that largely 
menstruation is toxicity leaving the body. <laughs> I don't know if this was intentional, but that's what came to my mind. All right, so let's take a look at the Finnish study that what I've learned cited to show that vegan children are low in vitamin A. And to be clear, he said that vegan children had insufficient vitamin A. He didn't say that. The study did. The Finnish study, it's very interesting since it claimed it used vegan children that were vegan from birth and that the mothers were vegan before pregnancy. This is so rare and very, very interesting. The study mentions that most participants, including all vegans, took vitamin D supplements. And all but one vegan child took vitamin B12 supplements. Breakfast, lunch and afternoon snack were planned by a nutritionist and given to the children in the daycare. Daniel refers that no vegan child was deemed vitamin A deficient. However, all vegan children fell below vitamin A sufficient line. So why did what I've learned claim that the Finnish study showed that vegan children had insufficient vitamin A when none of them were vitamin A deficient? Finnish studies showed that vegan children had insufficient when none of them were vitamin A deficient. Insufficient. Insufficient. Deficient. There is something to be said regarding deficiency versus insufficiency. Where deficiency is the range believed to cause health issues, insufficiency is the range believed to impair optimal living and causing problems in the future. The fact that Daniel is contact with insufficiency is very strange to me. So vegans, even with the nutritionist planning your meals, you still cannot achieve ideal levels. I think this is a beautiful study, with the most meaningful flaw being the small amounts of participants. But unfortunately, that is the nature of human studies. The more precise we want to be, the smaller the study will be. At 24.43, LVL shows how hard it is to get enough vitamin A in a carnivore diet. But he used the same tactic he accuses anti-vegans of doing. Just random items thrown in with no regards to actual meals look like. More than half his calories are made out of muscle meats. I'm no expert in the carnivore diet, but isn't one of the tenets of carnivores to consume the whole animal? Organ meats are the most prized foods, right? Before we go any further, I would like to do a quick pause and talk about how a lot of people in the internet view nutritional studies. My viewers are tired of me saying the same thing, but a controlled, well-done nutritional study in humans is impossible. In order to determine the influence of certain nutrients in humans in regards to long-term health, we would have to make a double-blinded, randomized controlled trial with thousands of people from all over the world, make them do exactly the same amount of exercise, the same amount of sleep, control all social factors and live in the same area where they can be observed 24-7 for 200 years in order to determine generational influences. You would then have to repeat the same study for all known nutrients and then once again repeat everything for all the possible combination of nutrients. That would be the perfect human trial with almost no margin for error. Due to those pesky human rights violations, such studies are impossible and approximations are the best we have. All human studies will have major flaws, but the scientific community hopes that little by little we will get a better understanding of it all. Daniel here is the perfect example of someone who does not understand these facts. He will look at any study that contradicts his opinion and straight away try to find what is the flaw with the study and quickly dismiss it. Either it was not a randomized controlled trial, Maybe it was too small, the data collection was not perfect, it was anecdotes, it has hidden biases, or any other reason. These are important to note, of course, and they should not be ignored. But they should not be the end-all, be-all of the hard work of scientists. And if you look at the German study that he cited, the vegan children were within the reference range for vitamin A. I believe LVL misspoke here. The German study was on adults, not children. Something needs to be said regarding Joseph's editing choice here. There are a lot of instances in this video where the edits that he used can give you a different impression of what he's trying to communicate. And the 2021 study found vegan Finnish children to have insufficient vitamin A. And the 2020 German study found vegans to have a lower vitamin A level than omnivores. His point was to show that in spite of all the beta carotene that vegans eat, their numbers are still lower than omnivores. Which again, is not a death sentence for veganism. But the way he did the edits, it makes it look like both studies are showing deficiencies, when this is not the case. 
This is confusing for the regular person, but even more for the side that you are attacking, especially when low on DHA. I don't think neither side spent enough time with this paper to give it justice. I mean, leave it to the Germans to express as much data and detail as possible from such a simple study. A cross-sectional study with 36 participants and the Germans gives us 8 beautiful graphs and 35 sources. It is a little something for everyone. So let's sink our non-carnivorous canines in it, shall we? Just like LVL says, vegans had normal levels of vitamin A. However, this fact is based on the belief that the levels suggested as enough are indeed correct. This can devolve into a conversation of what is the minimum and what is optimal. Stepping away from vitamin A, let's see other interesting results. Iodine was presented by the researchers as a nutrient of concern, since in one third of the vegans, iodine excretion was lower than the WHO threshold value for severe iodine deficiency. Almost everyone was under the value by the WHO. Iodine supplementation in salt is very common and backed by very good research. But I feel iodine in the vegan community does not get the attention it deserves. Perhaps as seaweed becomes more and more prevalent in our diet, it won't be such a problem. Thyroid issues may rise from the lack of iodine, and with vegans and vegetarians having lower iodine intake, it would be a logical assumption that goiter and thyroid issues would be more prevalent in someone following such a diet. I found very little credible sources in regards to this matter. It does not really seem to be studied, at least not something that I could find. B1 is very interesting to observe that vegans had a higher prevalence. But B1, being prevalent in pork, fish and yogurt, the omnivores were having an average below recommended. It makes me ponder if the transition from pork to poultry has been increasing this deficiency. Very interesting for future research. Should we go back to eating pork instead of chicken? B2 deficiency were unsurprisingly only seen in vegans. The average was still within the range, but some members of the vegan group were under and overall the vegan numbers were lower. B12 in this study was found to be adequate for both groups, with vegans having higher concentrations than omnivores. Researchers attribute this to the high levels of supplementation that vegans adopted. We will talk about supplementation in a moment, but for now at least, supplementation has seemed to increase blood levels in most tests. This paper has so much information, and perhaps I should do a video on it alone. I encourage you to take a look, it is very interesting. It seems Daniel is admitting that it's unlikely to get enough vitamin D without the use of supplementation. Then, the trope that we heard many times. The reason for the marginal vitamin D status are presumably neglecting supplementation. 50% of women and men aged 65 and older in North America were found to be vitamin D deficient. Now, last I checked, vegans are not 50% of the population. I wish vegans would realize how absurd this argument is on its own. I understand where it's coming from, comparing a group to a subset to show differences. Keep in mind that you are comparing statistics that include a vast majority of standard American dieters. In this case, maybe 50% of the population is vitamin D deficient. The question now is, do vegans have, on average, low vitamin D numbers? Yes. Yes, they do. Even if the vegan values are better relative to the whole population, it still does not prove that veganism is good. Being better than the worst is not a very good argument. Are the vegan numbers better than the Mediterranean diet? than the carnivore, than the paleo? This is the question that it should be answered. Which of the diet is the healthiest for us? That is the numbers that you should be comparing to, not to a bunch of slobs that put Mountain Dew on baby sippy cups. And what, and how old do you reckon you were when you had your first Mountain Dew? Like how old? I would probably say two or three. I would say at least a 12 pack. What about you talking about your cousin before? I would say about six or seven cans a day and uh, he's only three years old. And that, what, how does he, does he drink it from the can? No, from the bottle. She puts it in his bottle. Daniel also mentions vitamin D supplementation. However, he forgot to mention if the vegans in the studies presented were taking vitamin D or animal-based vitamin D. If we look at the numbers from the previous mentioned German paper, we see a common trend seen in other datasets. Vegans who supplement can achieve higher values, Vegans who do not supplement will achieve lower values than omnivores. So, can we stop telling vegans that the only supplement they need is vitamin B12? And the only thing one really has to seriously be concerned about on a plant-based diet is getting a regular, reliable source of vitamin B12. Otherwise, you can end up uh, paralyzed, demented, or dead. Okay. Vitamin K2 is by far my least studied vitamin. When doing my degree, K1 and K2 were not really talked about separately. 
This is mainly due to the rarity of cases of vitamin K deficiency. It seems vitamin K is a bigger factor in infancy rather than adulthood. Let's start with the study he cited. When it comes to dietary intake, they mentioned natto as the biggest source and animal foods as a much more negligible source. They mentioned that regarding MK7, not vitamin K2 in general. Specifics are important since no vegan food has MK4, but some animal foods have MK7. The role of K2 in our diets is still speculative and only backed by associations and correlations. Maybe it is important, maybe it is not, but vegans are not consuming K2 and don't come here and tell me that you eat natto on a regular basis. I couldn't find any study on bioavailability of MK4 from foods rather than supplements, but we can look at studies with doses you can practically obtain from diet. Uh, no, 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 stop. You cannot. Saying supplementation is the same as food has gotten us into trouble in the past. This study assessed 420 micrograms of MK4 compared to 420 micrograms of MK7. As you'll see, the only reasonable way to obtain this is with goose liver. But regardless, let's say someone managed to eat this amount of MK4 regularly. Is it actually absorbed? No. Such a big claim from a single study is quite a claim, and I hope there is no conflict of interest and- Oh, look, TS works for J Oil Mills Inc. Hmm. I wonder what this company do. J Oil Mills Inc. is currently one of the leading edible oil producers in Japan and our product line includes hundreds of offerings like oils, fats, processed oils and fats, food stuff such as starches and soy sheets, fine materials including micronutrients such as vitamin K2. So convenient. What a coincidence. The study that Daniel presents shows that MK4 might be useless in humans. It should be considered but it cannot be taken as gospel, since K2, in general, is still not understood. Vegans have to keep in mind that none of you are actually eating natto. K2 has been associated with a decreased coronary calcification, while K1 has not. This association has only been shown in correlations. The role of MK4 is still unknown and might be useless, however, MK7 has showed promise. MK7 can be obtained through certain fermented foods like natto, kimchi and sauerkraut, but also animal foods like cheese, liver and certain meats. In much lesser amount for sure, but it is a constant source. Does that mean that MK4 is useless? We're still not sure. What we know for sure is that no vegan that defends eating natto is eating natto. What I've learned suggests things like hard cheese and whole milk for vitamin K2 when they have abysmal amounts that they are in smaller amounts when comparing to natto, but that does not mean they are useless. How much MK4 to MK13 we need? No idea. We need more research. K2, but vegetable oil in fact hampers the activity of vitamin K, making you need even more. Daniel conveniently ignores the argument that vegetable oil may impede K2 absorption. Strong indications showed polyunsaturated fatty acids impeding K2 absorption and or synthesis in human guts, so a diet higher in these oils will need more vitamin K to produce the same effects. I would much rather have a 15% lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower CRP or inflammation, and lower body fat rather than having a 5% higher bone mineral density and three more centimeters of height. You mentioned LDL being lower, but you forgot to mention HDL to be lower as well, which could be considered a detriment. You also forgot to mention the higher homocysteine levels, which as Dr. Gregor puts it, seems to be an epidemic or too much homocysteine in the blood of vegans. Um, again, this is a toxic substance, so we want low levels in our blood. So now the goal is to have a homocysteine level under 10. Vegans, 27. Also note, at minute 30 to 55, LVL says that the children levels hit the RDA, but they were still shorter, which indicates that the RDA may not be ideal value for maximizing health and growth. What I've learned cites some studies showing that vegans have lower B12 levels to support the notion that, quote, perhaps B12 supplements don't work exactly like animal foods do. Daniel goes off on this part because he misunderstood the point. The point was not to prove that B12 did not work. The point was to show that in spite of vegans knowing that they have to supplement, they don't. By the time Will says on minute 34, 33, perhaps B12 supplements do not work as well as animal foods do, I do see here where the confusion comes from. And, if I was blinded by a perceived attack on my ideology, I would have probably made the same mistake. A patient can go in there with symptoms of, of anemia, shortness of breath, palpitations, fatigue, brain fog, etc. B12 levels are in the normal range. What the patient should ask for is active B12. This is another great point that vegans ignore constantly. Your B12 levels might be great thanks to supplementation, 
But what if it's the wrong kind of B12? Then how would you even know if it's the reason for your symptoms? Um, I believe methylcobalamin is the most absorbable form. I encourage people to choose cyanocobalamin, not methylcobalamin. If you suffer from B12 deficiency, but your B12 levels are high due to supplementation, what are you going to do? I guess this is an opportunity as good as any to talk about supplementation. This is one of the tenets of the vegan diets. Vegan diets don't work without supplementation, so these ones are better be perfect. Your diet, your health, your well-being depends on you being consistent in taking medicine. One of the biggest problems in modern medicine is that the patient skipping medication not due to stubbornness, there is a lot of that, but sometimes simply because they forget. And no matter who you are, the more medications you have to take, the more likely you are to mistreat yourself. I've been vegan nine years and taking B12 supplements, but this year, apparently, I was not good enough at taking them regularly enough. And, like Daniel in this video mentioned, it's not just B12 that is needed for vegans. Vitamin D is becoming essential. And perhaps K2, choline, zinc and other cases like DHA, EPA, calcium, which leads us to our second problem. Vitamin and mineral interactions is a complicated field that is not fully understood. Someone being low in bone mineral density might not be a lack of calcium, but perhaps a lack of vitamin D or even K2. If you are low in him, it might not be lack of iron, but lack of copper, for example. Vitamin C is considered an antioxidant, but if you take too much, it causes oxidative stress. If you are low in collagen, it could be a sign of low vitamin C, zinc, copper, silicon, lysine or proline, who knows? The point is, taking a supplement or fortified foods may give you the nutrients in a concentrated and more potent manner that your system cannot handle. It may be harmful to you, as proven in the calcium fortification test. In regards to supplements, we already have three problems. Adherence, quantity needed and interference with other nutrients and even medicine. However, this is not the whole list. Supplements are not well regulated, so it means that you better choose the correct brand or you might be buying sugar pills that will cost your wallet and your health. Another thing to bear in mind is that the type of supplement you get might be ineffective, just like we saw with MK4 and MK7, but also with others like B12. One more issue is the uncertainty in the long term that these supplements might have in our health. We already gave the calcium supplementation example. This one took years to see that it was detrimental, when all indications showed the opposite to be possibly true. How do we know regarding the other supplements? How do we know if they're safe or not 10 years down the road? Lastly, and this one is just for the vegans, a lot of supplements are not even vegan, just like D3. To have so much trust in the supplement company that you would bet your life on it, it is either very brave or very idiotic. Brave, but uh, foolish, my old Jedi friend. Now let's talk about the Dutch study. This paper was on omnivorous and vegetarian children, not vegan children. I'm not sure why he would cite this when trying to say that vegan children tend to be shorter when vegan children and vegetarian children are not the same thing. And it you mean like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics did? They constantly confounded vegans and vegetarians and even plant-based diets that mean meat and fish included. Vegetarians and vegans are often compared because it's believed that vegans are a more extreme form of vegetarianism. So any positives that vegetarians have will be amplified for the vegans as well as the negatives. The Finnish study that we talked about before mentioned something very interesting. Perhaps this is not the correct approach. Perhaps an all-plant diet changes your metabolism in ways that science has not studied yet. One easy comparison is the carnivore diet, where it defies logic by its practitioners not showing any symptoms of scurvy, even though the dietary intake of vitamin C is much lower than the recommended. There is no doubt in my mind that in a vegan diet, our body needs will be different in the same way. Which makes me even more scared for vegan mothers and children who are trying to follow the recommended advice for omnivores while eating only plants. This experimental diet should not be recommended until further studies and time has passed. The discussion devolves into fiber. Long-term watchers of the channel know that this is a topic that affects me personally. For the next few minutes we will be talking about poop. So, if this is a topic that makes you uncomfortable, please keep ahead to this number. A 2012 study found in 63 patients with constipation, reducing fiber intake improved symptoms. But eating a zero fiber diet completely eliminated all symptoms. This study to me was an absolute eye-opener, the first time I encountered it four or five years ago. It is such a fuck you to nutritional science as proof that maybe we have no idea what the hell we are talking about. 
fiber and its function on constipation was, and still is, a golden rule in health and nutrition. And yet, this small study proved that maybe, just maybe for some people, the best thing is to not consume fiber at all. Daniel and his source present the study flaws very well. However, the fact that self-reported zero-fiber diet reported no symptoms? Dear listeners, I don't think you realize how rare a full recovery is on nutritional studies. Even assuming that the people claiming no fiber ate a little bit of fiber here and there, they said they completely resolved their symptoms. This is something that I had to try for myself. And it worked. And every patient I've worked with so far that has reduced or completely eliminated fiber has reported an improvement on their symptoms of constipation. Please notice, I said symptoms. I suffered from constant bloating and abdominal pain at least two to three times a week. I just assumed it was normal. I had it since I was a kid. My brothers and sisters didn't have any, so why was I different? This study saved me and a lot of people a lot of pain. Some people think that constipation just means not pooping once a day. But the symptoms of constipation are very rarely studied in nutrition. What does it matter if my poops are solid and I'm going two to three times a day, if I'm suffering from pain and bleeding? Next time you see a paper regarding constipation, check if they were interested in the symptoms or in the poop. Eating more fiber of course will make you poop more. Problem solved, right? Oh. What's that? You have constant pain and are bleeding from your ass? Well, you need more fiber. How are we scientists so moronic at times? But let's see what Daniel has to say. Here are some much higher quality papers seeing if fiber helps with constipation. The sample sizes were 14,024 adults. Oh, very good. So many participants. Wait, what the fuck? Self-reporting? Questionnaire? Only three cycles in five years? Only stool consistency was used. How is this helping people pooping blood? And check this out. Only the food consumed 24 hours before the interview was recorded. Dear vegans, I beg of you. Go on a no fiber diet just for two weeks. Please, just try it out. See how you feel. I already told you. You make me a correct vegan diet. I will follow it for one month. You just have to not consume fiber for two weeks. Think of the animals you would save with this trade. The rest of the studies he shows are the same thing. They do not address symptoms, only poop. Vegan loves their poop like this study that the scientists made vegans eat their own poop to get enough B12. <laughs> this leads me to people on the internet and their huge focus on the pyramid of evidence. All sides of the discussion love to bring this point up and it's time to die. It's not just the vegans. Please, everyone listening to this video, I want you to listen carefully. The pyramid is a lie. It is more a guide to beginners rather than to be taken literally. What I mean by that is that Daniel here is the perfect example of putting the pyramid into practice in an erroneous way. The problem is that this pyramid in reality actually looks like an amalgamation of blobs. A case study may be more valuable than a meta-analysis and an animal trial might have more value than a randomized control trial in humans. I know this is confusing but please Keep listening. This pyramid only stands tall if we assume that the tests that we have done have no conflict of interests, with no bias from the authors, and with perfect data collection and perfect caution for wrong data. Since we are human, this pyramid kind of falls apart. Alex Karev informed Dr. Hod that Dr. Gray tampered with my clinical trial. She switched around the placebos and the drugs, probably invalidating my trial. A case study is not disproven because a randomized controlled trial disproved it. Think of science as a blade. We are always sharpening it, but it is never sharpened. Scientific evidence is just like a sharpening tools, but perhaps when we take a step back, the blade that we thought it was sharpened is now crooked. More than once, it happened that the same test was made, repeated, and the results were different. It is sometimes impossible to account for all variables. Dismissing a study that is low on the hierarchy of evidence because of its position, it's complete anti-science. Can you repeat the trial and the results be replicated? Can you do it in other countries with different age ranges? Does that mean that I recommend to all my patients a no-fiber diet? No, I do recommend for them to try it and see how it feels. If a patient tells me I followed your diet to a T and I saw no improvements, then it does not mean that he did it wrong or that the study is wrong. It means that we have different metabolisms. What a conclusion. 
This is why nutritional information and knowledge moves so slowly. We already know for years that the heart lipid hypothesis is wrong. And yet, the majority of medical practices do not act accordingly because what if we are wrong again? Veganism is still not proven safe due to its many flaws. Vegans say that there are patches for these flaws but these have not been tested or proven safe. The whole food vegan diet has already died. You know you need at least fortification. You have been wrong in the past, but no, this time you are right. However, in Western countries with varied and abundant food supplies, it is not clear that this reduced bioavailability has any functional consequences. Although vegetarians tend to have lower iron stores than omnivores, they appear to have no greater incidence of iron deficiency anemia. Why would what I've learned not mention that this reduced bioavailability doesn't seem to have any functional consequences? That is not what the study says. The study says that on Western countries, with a variety and abundant foods, this makes the reduced bioavailability a non-factor. If this is true, it means that it is a factor on countries where there is no such abundancy or variety. And not just countries, but even cities that do not possess this variety, it can be a problem. In the same study, the author expresses his concern from women of childbearing age, aka women that lose blood and iron once a month. I have to give it to Daniel, he was right about one thing. It's obviously very easy to scare people when it comes to phytic acid and nutrient absorption. I've seen a lot of carnivores do this as well. Saladino is a great example of this. Just because a plant food has a certain phytochemical, it does not mean it's harmful for you. Like everyone says, the dose makes the poison. However, I do not agree to Daniel when he says, none of these inhibitory mechanisms really matter. Thinking like this is why so many people suffer from an undiagnosed gluten allergy. These things are poison, whether we can take it or not should not be assumed. Phytic acid inhibiting absorption of nutrients is a decades old theory that is just taken as fact at this point, and we'll talk about it in a second. Spinach is thought to be a great source of iron, but you can only absorb 2% of it because of the oxalate in it. There is no citation for any of these claims at all. The claims are just made. Well, because it's not really a study, it's a magazine article. A weird source to quote by what I've learned, and I can't really justify it. What I've learned said that you can only absorb 2% of the iron in spinach because of the oxalate in it. The source makes zero mention of the word oxalate. Yeah, I can't justify this claim either. I did notice that Joseph, in a previous video titled Carnivore and Egyptians, merges anti-nutrients into one section, usually referring to phytic acid and oxalates in the same phrase, where they might be dangerous for different reasons. Oxalates are not in my comfort zone. And I still need way more knowledge when it comes to these interactions with nutrients. Me, personally, I've always associated oxalate with calcium absorption, not iron. And yet, it is still not certain it impedes calcium absorption. Strange that tannins were not mentioned, as this is a much stronger correlation to iron absorption impediment. We don't really need to care too much about the oxalates causing iron absorption issues. A good point from Daniel but only in regards to nutrient absorption. However, oxalates are dangerous for other reasons. The association with kidney stones is very strong, although a minority of the kidney stones were reported regarding this, and the pins and needles sensation reported in case studies is also something to be looked out for. Cooking spinach, just like in beans, reduces these anti-nutrients to a minimum, but the vegan obsession with juices and smoothies makes me worry of how much oxalate we are actually consuming. The non-heme iron in plants and supplements is quite poorly absorbed. I really need to investigate more about soy. It seems like it's a godsend to vegans. Daniel here presents us with a study and says soy iron absorption is 29%. The subjects on this paper did not actually consume soy. Soybean ferritin was isolated, purified, as previously described, by utilizing a combination of seed extraction, fractionation by filtration, centrifugation, ammonium sulfate precipitation, and ion exchange chromatography, and analyzed by sodium dodexyl sulfate gel electrophoresis to determine purity. Can you really call this soy anymore? So you could technically say that the iron supplement made from soy is absorbed, but the iron in soy may not be. In one USDA study, more than 200 adults and children consumed one or two meals a day that contain either an all-beef product or a beef product that contain 20% of soy protein. 
The soy protein was in the form of soy isolate, soy concentrate or soy flour. In this study, the addition of soy did not adversely affect iron status. In fact, there was some indication that the iron status was actually improved. This may have been in part because the researchers have found that while soy reduces the absorption of non-heme iron in meat, it may actually increase the absorption of heme iron. So soy byproduct seems to help iron, but what about soy itself? All nutritional knowledge assumed the dogma that phytic acid in soy causes non-heme iron malabsorption. The present findings, however, strongly suggest that phytic acid is a major inhibitor in soy protein isolates. This was also shown in infant formula, where soy formula with phytic acid removed improved ferritin levels. It's an older code, sir, but it checks out. So here's what seems to be true. Phytic acid seems to inhibit non iron absorption. Vitamin C counters the phytic acid and boosts iron absorption, meaning that the iron in processed soy will be useless if not accompanied by vitamin C. Vitamin C is very fragile and is lost in the cooking or the transformation into protein isolates used in many foods. Because you cannot eat soybeans raw, I would say that most of the time the iron from soy is not as good. The exact number of iron absorption from a single nutrient is very hard to tell. The problem arises from the difference between iron and heme iron. Daniel compares 29% of iron from soy absorption to 30% from heme iron. The problem with this comparison is that you are comparing foods with different values. Let me ask you this. What do you prefer? 30 bills of $1 or 30 bills of 100? 30 bills are 30 bills, right? Even if we accept that vegan foods have the same percentage as meat. In terms of iron, the type of iron is not the same. So vegans and vegetarians have to consume much more iron than meat eaters, as well as glycine, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin B6. Vegans and vegetarians are constantly shown to have lower iron levels, although they claim to be within range. I'll never understand that cope. Even omnivores can suffer from low iron levels. If vegans and vegetarians have it harder, then for sure a bigger number will be deficient. So the authors admit that vegans were so underrepresented in this paper that you can't use it to make claims about vegans. Again, scientists just assume that veganism is a more extreme version of vegetarianism and this will cause confusion. In vegetarians, the iron levels are lower, therefore in vegans, it will be worse. This is definitely true if a vegan has no information on how to make the diet right, which I would argue that no one really knows how to do it at the moment. But let me do the work that neither Joseph or Daniel did, and find some studies on vegan diets alone. Here we go. This is an interesting study, where women on it were recommended to increase their iron consumption and did not consume iron supplements. They were vegan for at least one year prior to the study. The biggest flaw of this study is unfortunately the questionnaire. I think we need permission to lock up 500 vegans and actually measure what they eat. Another weird point is calling people moderate vegans, as they eat milk, eggs and dairy. Why didn't they study only the strict vegans? Simpletons are asking. Well, because strict vegans are very, very rare. Even those saying that they are, 99% of them are lying. I have sort of just become a Cheegan. I'm also a cheating vegan. I was a cheating vegan. Ah, uh, I'm a Cheegan. The results are interesting. According to the people in the study, they were eating above the iron RDA. However, deficiencies were still showing up. Does this study prove that it is impossible for vegans to have normal iron levels? No, not at all. Like all human trials, this one has major holes in it. Is it an indication that perhaps vegans should be consuming more iron than the RDA? Yes, it is. If you look at the limitation section of the first paper he cites, it literally says, findings regarding individuals who adhere to specific vegetarian diet types, such as vegans, were underrepresented and thus conclusions regarding iron status among such individuals were not possible. This is not what the author said. If you continue to read the limitations that you conveniently cut out, this makes the generalization of the findings difficult. Nevertheless, the observed overall pattern of vegetarians having lower iron stores and higher deficiency prevalence in some studies is likely valid. In this paper, vegans are included in the vegetarian group. Does it prove that vegans have a higher risk than other diets to be iron deficient? Vegans could be an outlier. But as the paper says, here are the factors that hurt iron in vegetarians. The bulk of iron consumed by vegetarians is, in its less bioavailable form, non iron Plant foods contain potent iron absorption inhibitors, including phytates, oxalates, and phenolic compounds. Although iron intake among vegetarians is often higher than among non-vegetarians, iron requirements for vegetarians is about 1.8 times higher compared to non-vegetarians. All this, 
also applies to veganism. So we need a reason to why these rules would not apply for vegans. If you want to know more about iron absorption, I recommend the following paper. It is such a great read and vegans will be happy to know that the authors recommend fortified foods. So hold on, why exactly did what I've learned cite this study as evidence that vegans are at a greater risk of iron deficiency when the conclusion states that this finding was only made for vegetarians? Regarding the second paper, in the findings, you will find the quote, 10 out of the 13 studies reported, iron status amongst both vegetarians, including vegans and non-vegetarians, which, if you look at the tables of data presented, again merged vegetarians and vegans. A bit further down you will find the quote, the highest mean serum ferritin was reported among 15 vegan female participants from the United States and among 25 female vegans aged more than 50 years from Germany. So perhaps vegans are right, their iron intakes might be better than vegetarians. Although the first reference is from a study that used supplements, while the second study is the one I referenced before, end quote, Although the mean iron intake was above recommended level, 40% of the young women were considered iron deficient. A bit further down you will see the phrase, iron status among vegans, separately from other vegetarians, was reported in three studies, data published by Wilson and Ball, showed much higher prevalence of ferritin depletion among vegans, compared to both vegetarian and non-vegetarian male participants. And, if we continue, the prevalence of iron depletion among vegan women in the United States reached 27%, which, although lower than the prevalence reported in research from other countries, should be of concern. So, when the study finally says, in a, all studies except for one with female Adventist vegans, vegetarian women had a considerable higher prevalence of anemia, it does not mean that vegetarians were found deficient and that vegans were not. It means that vegans, in all studies except for the Adventist one, were also found to be prone to deficiency. These studies, including three that separated vegans and vegetarians, one of them being the Adventist study, and the other two finding vegan women prone to deficiency. So, the answer to the remark, why exactly did what I've learned cite this study as when the conclusion states that this finding was only made for vegetarians? The key word being suggest, which is a scientific way to say very likely. The discussion then delves into stomach pH and how the food we eat changed over the centuries. In the end, this is just an appeal to nature with not much to say. Just because the food is newer, it does not mean it's worse or that we are less adapted to eat it. It is more likely the case, but not always. It is fucking 3 a.m. Why am I researching about rabbit stomach? Then the discussion delves into mental health and meat. This is something that I would definitely not touch with a 10 feet pole. I have zero knowledge when it comes to mental health. Usually a patient that is referred to me with mental issues comes from a psychiatrist that just wants me to help him lose weight, which might help with his mental illness. But I personally have never looked into the link between the two. Um, Long-term vegans can suffer brain shrinkage and, and uh, dementia risk. And get this, vegetarians and vegans can easily be EPA and DHA deficient. It is true that we need specific components of whole foods and not whole foods per se. Nobody is falling victim to this concept if it is literally true. But for that claim to be true in real life, we would have to know all the nutrients needed in the correct quantities, in the correct combinations, and control for every other variable like nutrient degradation. In theory, Daniel is correct. The human body is nothing but a machine. Given the correct components, there should be no reason for it not to work. But in practicality, this knowledge certainly might never come to exist. And for sure, it does not exist right now. According to a 2012 study, despite taking prenatal supplements, 58% of pregnant women had iron levels below normal. Is that the women also ate meat? If I wanted to, I could say, Despite eating meat, 58% of pregnant women had iron levels below normal. But shouldn't the supplements compensate for the lack of B12? And how much meat did these women actually ate? And was it red meat or chicken? There's so many things here that are left unclear. The claim was not that iron supplements don't work. The claim is that in certain cases it might not work. The source you cited says exactly the same thing. This is why it's dangerous to rely on supplementation when, when completely replacing nutrients. 
we do not know what might influence this absorption or what influences these kind of quantities of iron might bring. This is why food is usually considered a better source of nutrients rather than pills. No doctor in this world will tell you not to eat food and get everything you need from pills and supplements. And did you even read the main results? 40 results with low quality evidence. 22 results with very low quality evidence. 28 results with moderate quality evidence. 6 results with trials with no mention of quality. Some results were not of any statistical significance. I don't think that this is a good paper to cite. One of the authors is or was, perhaps I'm not sure, the vice president and paid by the company that distributes vitamins all over the world. It's a non-profit and I'm sure very useful to many people, but can this person be objective? This is your quality paper. I don't understand. I'll never understand scientists that quote these sorts of papers as good evidence. Just because of the total high numbers? Is a bigger pile of shit better than smaller piles of shit? I don't believe so. Are you really telling me that a properly conducted study with 50 people would not be better than this bullshit? You see why your beloved pyramid of evidence is actually lying to you? The conversation then turns into Colleen. So choline absorption from eggs is high. I'm not going to argue with that. But as I always say on this channel, we have to actually look at health outcomes rather than just, you know, get scared about the potential negative health effects of not consuming a certain food. So let's look at some outcomes. This paper found that higher adherence to plant-based diets, especially healthful plant-based diets, is associated with a lower likelihood of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Daniel talks about how plant-based diets are associated with lower likelihood of fatty liver disease. Yeah, no shit. Plant-based diets are currently the best diets in the world in terms of longevity. Do you know what plant-based diet means? Most of them are also omnivore diets with plenty of fish, meat and eggs. According to some sources, your plate can be one-third animal foods and your diet would still be considered plant-based. The vegans that use the argument to say something like fewer animal foods is good, therefore no animal foods is better, are idiots that can simply be refuted with the same logic regarding salt. Little is good, none is deadly. The papers you presented mentioned the presence of animal foods in the plant-based category. Is that veganism? Or perhaps you are saying that meat eaters have more non-alcoholic fatty liver disease than vegans? Granted, for sure, there is only a point for veganism if choline deficiency is the only reason why such a disease appears. Turns out, obesity is the main culprit and as we both know, vegan diets have a lower BMI than omnivore diets. Again, veganism gets the award for second worst diet right after the standard American diet. Daniel then talks about the following And here's study. a paper looking at the association between four different dietary patterns. Also understand that the animal food dietary pattern contain high consumption of animal foods, including egg. Wait, 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 wait. Please, show the rest of the paragraph. Don't be shy, come on. Animal food pattern, high intakes of kelp, seaweed and mushroom pork, beef, mutton, poultry, cooked meat, eggs, fish and shrimp, beans and greens. The grain vegetables pattern, high intakes of coarse grains, tubers, vegetables, mushrooms, kelp, seaweed, cooked meat and beans. And straight from the discussion, further analysis showed that food consumption in the animal food dietary pattern was associated with an increased risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the grains vegetables dietary pattern was associated with a decreased risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So animal food contained high level of beans and grain vegetables high levels of cooked meat. With the same study, I could claim that beans are the ones causing fatty liver. And how was the data collected? Food questionnaire. Daniel. Who, who picked this study for you? I know this was not you. You are smarter than this, and usually you would not hide the data relevant to the other side and be this tricky. Who put this study up for you? That's, I, I really want to know. Finally, the last study is directly regarding veganism and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Unfortunately, this study does not address the core of the argument, which is choline in the prevention of fatty liver. I'm not sure what was the point of this study. Interesting to see nonetheless, and I hope more it's done. But please, Check out this part. I loved it. It's very funny that eight people were like, nope, I'm not eating that shitty food, which means they were probably not eating Morningstar nuggets, Mr. Daniel. 
This paper found a 14% reduction in risk for cardiovascular disease mortality when you go from less than one serving of tofu per month to more than one serving of tofu per week. Let's pretend there was no such thing as naturally occurring calcium from plant foods and that vegans had to rely on fortified soy milks and other vegan products to get sufficient calcium. Why would I care? You should care because we are still not sure they work at all. This is where Will reference a paper that showed calcium supplementation increasing the risk of heart disease. While it's true that Joseph forgot to link the study referenced, I can't believe that neither Daniel nor any of his helpers saw the video with the big title Supplements, which only proves the statement that supplements might not work or worse actually cause you harm when not done in the appropriate amounts and at the appropriate times. What are the appropriate amounts and appropriate times, no one really knows at the moment. And this is why veganism can be very dangerous. ...is to educate yourself. You'll be much more motivated to maintain a vegan diet. Um, I believe methylcobalamin is the most absorbable form. I encourage people to choose cyanocobalamin, not methylcobalamin. Here he covers your B12 with 200 micrograms of B12. I would recommend 1,000 micrograms a day. You only need 2.4 micrograms uh, a day. So that's where they got the new 4 to 7 a day recommendation. And if you take a 5 thousand microgram dose it will not hurt you you should be able to take one of those 500s you know chop it up in pieces and take you know a little piece uh, once a week or something like that it can even be any dosage because the, the biggest danger of supplementation is the unknown effects they might cause in the long term also how desperate do you have to be to grasp at straws that you have to rely on cat studies going, this guy's not getting any of this <laughs> are not cats. The point is, it's not about what's natural. It's about track record. Initially, the deficient cat diet seemed not too terrible. Sure, the first cats had some problems, but the bigger problems started to appear in the kittens. Then the full picture of just how inappropriate this diet was appeared a generation later. In my view, this is one of the biggest arguments of the whole video. In case you are not aware, veganism has only been possible for the last 50 to 60 years and during the majority of that time we had no idea how to do veganism right. I would argue we still don't know. The cat study shows that even when the cats had a diet assumed to be healthy, the next generation had major health issues and the third generation did not even reproduce. We don't have generational proof of veganism yet and this unknown is why it can be so dangerous.